Now moving on to ABC. Moving on. What shape was the network in when you arrived? ABC was in transition when I got there. Now they had a, a horrendous season, the prior season. And, uh, but to uh, Fred Pierce's credit, and, and uh, he worked very closely with Michael Eisner, who was in charge of uh, the West Coast. You know, he had, Michael had been working for Barry Diller before Barry went to uh, Paramount. They managed to create a uh, kind of a, a structure so that there were certain tentpole shows that were already in place, you know, which I thought was great. I mean, I was very surprised that there was as much there as there was. You know, for instance, uh, Happy Days was in place on Monday night and doing okay. On uh, Monday night, I'm sorry, on Tuesday night, yeah. And uh, Cotter was already in the schedule, I believe, on, on Thursday night. And Barney Miller was, uh, I believe, on Thursday. And uh, they had Streets of San Francisco and Six Million Dollar Man. And, uh, and they had just scheduled uh, Starsky and Hutch. So there was enough there that it wasn't barren. You know, it's unlike NBC. You know, when I when I went over there and there was nothing, I mean here there were some some rays of uh, light and hope uh, going in, and I I really to to their credit, I mean they created something out of nothing, because uh, Barry Dillon's last season there was uh, a really bad year. That was the year of the K. They put a lot of shows on that started with K, the Kolchak, Kodiak. Uh, there were about five shows with K's, and that was the year of the Sonny Bono Comedy Hour. So it was a, a really bad year. So they got, Michael and Fred did a lot uh, in the mid-season, you know, to try to get it, to at least get it on an even keel. So it was very much a network in transition. In prime time, the daytime schedule was a mess. Uh, Saturday morning was a mess. Late night, they had this... Uh, kind of a, a, an anthology of a lot of different, the wide world of entertainment. It was a bunch of different things that uh, taped dramas, variety shows. It was, that was a hodgepodge, and, uh, and they were doing very poorly there. And they had just uh, debuted a show called AM America, which was doing a seven share, which was an absolute disaster with uh, Bill Butel. So if you look across the whole schedule, it was a mess, you know, with a little ray of light in, uh, in prime time. And that's uh, what I came into. Fortunately, you know, I, I, I looked around and I, I immediately sensed that Eisner was an exceptional piece of manpower, you know, and that I, I really had to keep him happy and keep him there. I mean, it was not my doing that he got passed over. So I, I was hoping he's not going to hold that against me, that he could really thrive under this setup. Because for him to continue on the West Coast was absolutely essential. I mean, they, I needed somebody who knew the West Coast community and could do the job. And there was nobody who could do it better than, than uh, him. So my first job was uh, to get him to stay. And uh, it took about a couple of months, but he, he did stay. And thank God. And there were also some very good people on the West Coast. So, I mean, Marcy Carsey was, was there. Tom Werner was there. Brandon Stoddard was in charge of the movies. Uh, so there were Frank Brill, who was kind of an old timer, but he was doing the variety shows. Um, and there were, there were enough good people, East and West. Ed Vane, who was a good, solid executive, was running the East Coast and the specials area and uh, daytime was reporting to him. So all told, there were, many, there were about 10 executives. And my primary uh, job was to keep those people in place I didn't want to come in there and sweep the place out. That's, uh, I felt what they needed more than anything else was the right direction. That with the right direction and the right motivation, these people would be great. So uh, I, I, uh, I don't know whether I brought anybody in to speak of uh, there. If I did, they were, you know, they were not major appointments. You know, they were just uh, filling little slots uh, here or there. And... Uh, you know, we set our sights uh, on the mid-season. That was the first thing. 
Because the fall, I kind of wrote off. I think the fall, the stuff that was going on in the air was awful. You know, there was a Howard Cosell variety show on Saturday night, if you could believe that, at 8 o'clock. There was a, uh, a rescue show that Jackie Cooper was producing called uh, Mobile One. There was a, a, a Western called Barbary Coast. I mean, it's just one worse than the other. They really, really lousy shows. Uh, and I, I just figured that this is, it's all crap. Uh, and if none of it is going to be around, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, uh, no sense of wasting a lot of time on it. And so the whole thrust was on uh, the midseason and the fall. And uh, one of the first projects that we put together, you know, thanks to Frank Brill's uh, relationship with uh, Ray Katz, the manager, was a Donnie and Marie special. You know, which we got on stage uh, a matter of months after I got there. And these kids were as fresh as can be. It was kind of another way to do a Sonny and Cher kind of a show. It's obviously with scale younger, and the Crofts are involved as uh, the producers. But it was a very, very successful special. And uh, on the basis of that special, you know, which we air tested uh, in the spring, we put that on the air in the, the fall. I believe it was put on in the fall, or it may have been midseason. I'm not sure. Uh, we also, uh, you know, resurrected some stuff that was in the development that I, that was just kind of going nowhere that I said, you know, we really should, uh, these are pretty good ideas. Charlie's Angels is one of those ideas. It was a development script that was then called Harry's Angels. And, uh, you know, so we piloted that very quickly. In recognizing it was a terrible script, but it just the whole idea was so appealing that, uh, do that. You know, in the movie group, there were two concepts that looked really interesting in terms of concept. One was Love Boat, and the other was Fantasy Island. And these were Brandon's, uh, Stoddard's uh, brainchild. So we got a couple of movies going uh, on there. Uh, there was a show that they had piloted that didn't get on called Family with Seda Thompson, which was uh, one of my favorite shows, and it was sitting on the shelf. And uh, I said, we're going to put that on the air. And that went on in, the, in uh, mid-season, went on in uh, February, on two, late Tuesday night, and was uh, a major success, but and a really wonderful drama. It's kind of a, a, a upper-middle-class uh, suburban family. Seda Thompson was in it. Uh, Christine McNichol was the first thing that she did of any note in, uh, on television. Meredith Baxter. Uh, and it was produced by Spelling. Um, and uh, so that by the time we got into fall, you know, Charlie's Angels went on the air. It was a big hit. Donnie and Marie was on. It was a big hit. That anchored Friday. Uh, we'd f kind of fine-tuned uh, uh, Happy Days by bringing the Fonzie character up front. You know, we, we really became the star of the show. Um, uh, and uh, I believe that Love Boat, we were working on our fifth pilot movie. Could have had a tough time casting it, but I was determined to get it on the air, that's, uh, that first full season. Um, so we, we went the first uh, full season. We had quite a few things that we added to, uh, to the shows that were there. When I, when I joined the network, Six Million Dollar Man was there. Uh, and uh, Starsky and Hutch and Barney Miller and uh, Cotter and uh, and that was basically the beginning that we added we in the first year you know, we added about uh, seven or eight shows to the stuff that was already there and then you know that started to develop a momentum then it uh, you know the, the luck enters into it a little bit they did a uh, a, a crossover episode, and they get, and they created the Bionic Woman, which was just meant as a one-time shot, and she was so good. Lindsay Wagner was so good in this thing. I said to Eisner, "Go, let's get make a series out of this thing." Just a, there was no series deal or anything, and uh, we got raped in the process. But we uh, he got the damn thing on the air in two months, and that played that went on in mid-season was a big hit.
on Wednesday night. Just a, an enormous hit. 38 share going in. Uh, you know, uh, Gary Marshall did a little guest shot with uh, Cindy Williams and uh, Penny Marshall playing a couple of girls from the other side of the tracks on Happy Days. And it just, you know, is one of these things where you see them and you say, they're great. They're great. Let's, let's get a stage. Let's get your Happy Days stage and write a dozen pages or so. Let's, let's see very quickly what happens if you give them more to do. And it was magic. And on the basis of that, we just said, go. Put it on the air. We put it on following Happy Days. And then that hour just exploded with some real good ballyhoo and promotion. And, you know, the show, the, the hour went from like a 32, 33 share to a 50 overnight. It was just the chemistry of the two shows. It worked so well that, uh, you know, it was a big hit. Uh, so we had 8 to 9 o'clock, and then we added uh, Three's Company in the spring, which was in another enormous hit open with a 50 share. That came back uh, in the following fall. And uh, with Soap as the companion piece at 9.30, which caused an enormous amount of controversy. Probably the most controversial show that I was involved with since uh, All in the Family. Nobody had seen a script or anything, and they were condemning it before it even uh, went on the air. And I never forget Don McGann and the president of Westinghouse who threatened to disaffiliate. We didn't pull the show. And, uh, I mean, it was an enormous nuisance, this thing. I spent the whole summer, you know, on soap. But ultimately, it, uh, by my second summer there, you know, we had uh, major sections of the schedule were uh, all of a sudden just thriving. You know, Wednesday night, all, all of a sudden, we were, we were a strong number one, you know, where we had Bionic Woman leading into Beretta, Lead, no, I'm sorry, Bionic Woman leading into Starsky and Hutch, leading into Charlie's Angels. And that was just a blaze. You know, Tuesday night with Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and Three's Company and Soap leading into Family. Tuesday night was as strong as Wednesday. You know, we always had good movies on Sunday, and with Six Million Dollar Man, we put Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys at eight which probably did better in that time period than anything else ever was programmed against uh, 60 Minutes. So Sunday night was in the plus column. You know, on Friday we had Donnie and Marie and, and a very young appeal movie, and that was doing very well. And, uh, and we were building a really good comedy block on Thursday with Cotter at 8 o'clock and Barney Miller at, uh, at 9, and we put a show called What's Happening in There which was kind of a television version of uh, Cooley High. And, and that thing took off. And so, by and large, with football on Monday and all the other nights, I, we were up into uh, <clears throat> a 21 or a 22 rating. I mean, we were doing about as well at ABC, a year and a half, two years in, as, as we had at uh, CBS, you know, during the heyday. And it all, but I, I do have to give credit where credit is due. It's, we started off with a basic foundation that was there when I got there. And then it was making the right choices. There was some good development that I don't think anybody realized they had. And then, you know, you just seize the moment. And I, more and more, that's what you have to do. You've got to seize the moment. When something happens unanticipated, you really have got to be uh, prepared to respond to it. And I kind of liken what Les Moonves did this year, you know, where it was an enormous crapshoot to take CSI and move it to 9 o'clock Thursday night following Survivor. There's no guarantee that that was going to work. But he basically was taking a 17, 18 share show. And that was a brilliant move. I mean, it's a very, very strong move. And I think that's something that uh, he didn't go into it saying that I'm going to do that. That's uh, He just responded to a, a situation and, and took advantage of it. And that's basically what happened at ABC, you know, where you really have got to respond to, uh, to what's happening. But what we did, you know, there was a philosophy of sorts to what it is we were basically appealing to a, uh, an urban, lower middle class audience. I mean, there's no, it was a working class audience. And we were, we were doing it with, uh, Connie said you wouldn't call sophisticated. Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Three's Company, Cotter, 
What's happening? Barney Miller was probably the most sophisticated thing we, uh, we had, you know, thanks to Danny Arnold. Uh, but by and large, I mean, it, it had a, there was a very distinctive brand to the ABC comedies as compared to what they're doing now, you know, where I think ABC has kind of lost its way with comedies. I don't think they know what, uh, what ABC is supposed to be. You know, we had a very clear fix. Soap was certainly a bawdy show. Uh, and that, uh, they didn't all work. I mean, we put some real dogs on the air that I can, uh, I can think of. You know, an hour show called San Pedro Beach Bums that uh, Aaron Spelling did. Lasted about a minute and a half on Monday. Uh, I mean, that was awful. A show called Mr. T and Tina. You know, with the, uh, you know, the Japanese fella from Happy Days. Pat Morita? Yeah, Pat Morita was in that. That was a Jimmy Comac show. Uh, so we, we, we had our shares of real dogs, but, uh, you know, very, very uh, specific kind of comedy. And the dramas, with the exception of, uh, you know, with the exception of family, which was in a class all by itself, were, again, young, swinging dramas. Charlie's Angels, Beretta, uh, Starsky and Hutch. Six Million Dollar Man. Six Million Dollar Man. You know, Bionic Woman. Again, they were really... Uh, a lot of the diverse concepts, but they all featured very young, attractive, hip uh, stars. Um, and and we did, uh, you know, a show like Donnie and Marie, even though it was a variety show, certainly fit into the mix. Uh, it's when we deviated from that that we got into trouble. We, uh, we did a variety show with Captain and Tennille. It didn't work because that was not they, – they were not uh, – they just were not designed for that ABC audience. And all the other stuff that, uh, that I've been talking about was. And, and finally, the fantasy shows. You know, we ended up putting them on, I believe, in the second year that I was there. You know, Love Boat and Fantasy Island, and they, it just, they were major hits. As big as anything could be. You know, uh, uh, Love Boat started at 10, and then we moved it to 9 to make room for Fantasy Island. Love Boat was a 50 share just totally destroyed CBS's lineup. Just, uh, but the audience was ready for fantasy. Certainly, in a, in a more serious vein, a uh, you know, $6 million man and bionic woman proved that. But this was fantasy of a different kind. And the love boat was a fantasy, after all. It's, uh, How did your tenure at CBS help to inform the manner in which you sort of went after their schedule with the programming decisions you were making at ABC? I really uh, thought more about what is good for ABC. You know, I just felt that ABC has their audience, and we know that they responded to a certain kind of show, and the uh, best thing to do is just uh, look ahead. Look straight ahead and do what you think is best. doesn't mean you're not familiar with what they're doing, but, uh, you know, we put Charlie's Angels on at the end of the Wednesday night. Whatever CBS had in there, it was it was old and it was uh, it wasn't going to be competitive to Charlie's Angels. That's all there is to it. So, you know, I knew pretty well that we uh, you know that we could do very very well. But what we did at ABC was uh, was create some great time periods. You know, eight eight thirty Tuesday was a great time period to put a Laverne and Shirley. You know, nine thirty Tuesday was a great time period to put soap on. Uh, you know, when we moved Charlie's Angels to 9 and put a new show at 10, you know, that was, a, that was also a great time period. You know, Love Boat at 9, Fantasy Island at 10, great time period. And that's, uh, you know, I think the scheduling was a, a big part of, uh, of the success. But uh, well, we'll talk about a lot of the individual shows, but... Um Again, and just sort of comparing and contrasting your CBS experience to ABC, um, how was the corporate atmosphere different at ABC? Well, ABC was just, a, you know, it's like you're in a fraternity. You know, ABC was just, uh, you know, dealing with a bunch of guys and, and some women who were, you know, your pals. It wasn't going up to Greenwich. It just was different. It was like uh, starting with Leonard Goldenson who was a very, very nice, warm guy. 
You know, if you did something well, you'd pick up the phone and come down to your office and say, hey, that was really good. They didn't know how to do that at CVS. So that was, that was the big difference. And it was like a big, happy family. And again, it was like Rocky. You know, I'll never forget, we had an affiliates uh, meeting. I thought, or it wasn't that, it was the uh, 25th anniversary, I think, of, uh, of ABC, uh, shortly before I left there to go to NBC. And we had, uh, at the, on their big sound stage in Prospect and Talmadge, they did a uh, 25th anniversary party. And we had all the stars of, of the network, past and present, there. They even had John Wayne at the party. But, uh, you know, going back to uh, the star of Cheyenne, and uh, Jim Arness was a present star. He was doing How the West Was Won as, as a series. And, uh, and at some point in time, they played Rocky. And the, 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 literally the whole hall just piled up on the stage for a picture, one of these panoramic uh, pictures. And it was really a very moving, uh, you know, to go to, play, be, to hear that Rocky song. And, uh, and also, you know, they used the song, We're Still the One, which was a great song. You know, that was the, uh, their theme song for about three years. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was, I think the, the accomplishment in primetime had never been number one before. They came close a couple of times. You know, they came play, uh, close in the late 50s, but they didn't have the, uh, the stations. You know, you know, during the Warner Brothers period, they came close during the late 60s. You know, when they had shows like Bewitched and Donna Reed and My Three Sons and uh, the, Un the Untouchables. And, uh, uh, but again, they were disadvantaged because of their stations. But this is the first time on every level they were number one. And by a big margin. It wasn't by a, a whisker. It's by a couple of rating points. And demographically, it was uh, amazing. So it was... Uh, you know, that was, it was a, a great high. And, uh, you know, it got a little tougher as I was going along. About a year and a half, two years into this experience, Eisner got a, uh, an offer from Dilla to come over to Paramount. And uh, I really didn't want to lose him. But he had it in his head that he was, at this point in time, this was a great opportunity. And he didn't feel he was getting any of the credit, which I don't think was necessarily true. But... Uh, he got to be such a pest that every day, I mean, I'd have an hour or two of his whining, saying he wants, I finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I went to Fred Pierce, and I said, you've got to let him out of the contract. This is just not right. I mean, he's driving me crazy. And uh, I hated to, let, to see him go. I mean, he was the best executive I've ever worked with. He is terrific. This is a guy you'd say, I want to do the bionic woman, and three days later, it's, it's, you got a deal in place, and it's done. And two months later, it's on the air. I mean, he was that good. And, uh, you know, he obviously proved himself at Paramount and Disney, that he's uh, very, very special. But uh, I didn't replace him. I couldn't replace him. And what I did, and I'm not sure it was the wisest thing in the world, I had the head of comedy, the head of drama, the head of movies reporting directly to me, and I, because I couldn't replace him, I just I didn't know who to who to reach for. I could, uh, and to just put somebody in between the people on the line and me would have been an even bigger mistake, and that really wore me out. So at the last year, it was really tough, because he was really a spark plug out there, and all of a sudden, I was doing a lot of work I hadn't been doing before. And you know, which is one of the reasons why when the NBC offer came up. You know, I really, I took it very, very seriously because I was worn out. Uh, but I think in, in terms of prime time, that pretty well uh, covers it. The other element in prime time that was uh, very important is that I determined very early that we had a, that the network is like a Christmas tree and that, you know, the big ornaments of the series, but they're, the other things are also important like mini series like movies, and particularly specials, star specials, went out of my way, you know, to, to line up every major personality that we could find to do specials for, uh, uh, CBS, for ABC. And, uh, you know, we, I think the first special deal we made was with Barry Manilow. 
and we did a deal with uh, John Denver. We did a deal with Olivia Newton-John. Uh, I believe we did a deal with Cass Elliott, you know, which we, I, I think we would have put her on had she not died. Um, and we, we got Perry Como's Christmas special over from CBS, you know, which was a client supplied uh, a special. We had the American Music Awards and we, uh, we uh, you know, we added, we, I, I know that by the, by the end of the first year, we had about uh, 100 hours of specials and were, I, I thought, the best, by far the best network with bright, young specials that uh, were really great. Uh, and we did major miniseries. You know, that, that didn't stop. I mean, after all, this was the network of Roots, uh, you know, which really kind of changed television. I think that under Brandon Stoddard, it was the most successful movie unit that I've ever seen. You know, and they did everything from the exploitive, like uh, Little Ladies of the Night, to uh, really quality uh, events, like In This House of Breed and... Uh, uh, Eleanor and Franklin, you know, we really ran the gamut. And we did one show that was developed on the East Coast uh, that's uh, um, called The Gathering with Ed Asner and uh, a really an all-star cast. And I forget his, the, uh, the writer's name. His last name was Poe, but uh, won an Emmy Award. It was, it was terrific. We did another picture called Mary White, which was uh, his newspaper editor in the Midwest. His uh, young daughter, teenage daughter died in a, a horseback riding accident, and he wrote this little poem for her. And this was a movie that was based on that, uh, that poem. But we did, I mean, it, it was one year we won uh, all the Emmys for dramatic uh, works, movies and miniseries, specials, and... Uh, you know, it was, uh, which is something that ABC had never done before. And again, that's very important. And to Les's credit, I think Les Moonves at CBS has made a concerted effort, you know, to keep the specials going on the air. You know, and I, uh, I mean, he kind of is like the last showman out there right now, I believe, at least in terms of the way that I see things. Uh <clears throat> You know, when I, when I had gone to ABC, I had mentioned earlier that they had a show called AM America with Bill Butel, which was an absolute disaster. And they wanted to give the time back to the stations. And I, I said, you know, it's really silly. You know, let the entertainment division take a shot at this thing, not the news division. You know, they have enough to worry about. They, at, this, at this point in time, Rune Arledge was not the head of news. Uh, but let us take one more shot at doing a show, because I really think I know what we could do, how we could do some business there. You know, if you think of the Today Show at that point in time as the New York Times, think of Good Morning America as the Daily News. And I swear to you, we can, we can, we can make inroads there and counter-program them on every level. And uh, I worked with Bob Shanks, who then was in charge of uh, specials and uh, assorted odd projects, and uh, and he helped put this thing together with Ed Vane. And we hired an actor as the host, David Hartman, whose last claim to fame was uh, Lucas Tatter, who is great. He was terrific. You know, he was every man sitting there just nice and warm. And I think NBC at the time had Frank McGee. You know, so, I mean, it was really great counter-programming and... Uh, and then we had a series of contributors. You know, it's like this, again, the Christmas tree theory. We had Rona Barrett doing gossip. We had Jack Anderson doing the Washington scene. Uh, we had Irma Bombeck doing a couple of spots a week from uh, Arizona. Uh, we had about six different contributors to the thing. And we just, uh, the only misstep was the, the co-host, you know, the woman that we had, Nancy Dussault, just was, was not up to it. And uh, I remember we taped the first week of shows. We didn't go live because I was so. I'm sorry, we're going to have to change right. tapes. I'm sorry, I didn't want.